Good day, everyone. Um, it is nice to see so many people have connected um, here today. I know that many of you are very interested in the um, hearing about the comprehensive review of the Global Indicator Framework. So thank you for joining us today. Um, today it is the IAG SDG Open Meeting, which is also an event for the 54th uh, UN Statistical Commission. My name is Carol Williams and I'm from Statistics Canada and I'm the current co-chair of the IAG SDGs. We're delighted to have you um, in our discussion today on the 2025 comprehensive review that is going to take place. Um, the topic is important to our group um, as 2025 is just around the corner. And the event today aims to share experiences and lessons learned from the 2020 comprehensive review and go over principles, criteria, strategies, and the timeline for the 2025 review. We're going to hear about lessons learned from the uh, 2020, com 2020 comprehensive review from the uh, United Nations Statistical Division from one custodian agency, WHO, from one IAG member, that's Brazil. Then we're going to hear how UNWTO is working together with the task team on sustainable tourism to prepare an indicator proposal for target 8.5, 8.9, pardon me, for the 2025 comprehensive review. I would ask everyone to put your questions in the chat, please. Um, and we will take these during the panel discussion. Um, and when we move into the panel session, we're going to add another um, IAG member, that's Sweden, and they will serve as a discussant to provide some initial thoughts on both the 2020 process and the upcoming 2025 process. And before we um, kick off to the presentations, we have a few housekeeping um, announcements. So your microphones have been disabled so that no one accidentally unmutes themselves. And again, please submit comments or questions into the chat window. Uh, we will try to address as many of them as we can, either by chat or orally. Except for the uh, panelists, kindly please turn off your cameras. This will hopefully um, reduce the bandwidth and, and perhaps lead to better sound quality. Um, as, as you saw at the beginning, the opening slide, the welcome slide, um, the event is being streamed live on YouTube and is being recorded. And the recording and all presentations slides will be available um, on the event page soon, soon after the event finishes. So without further ado, let's get started. So to start, I'm gonna run through the guiding principles, specific criteria and timeline for the 2025 review that was agreed upon by the IAG SDG at its 13th meeting last November. And you will also find the guiding principles in the IAG's uh, report to the 54th um, session of the commission. So um, excellent, uh, perfect. So having uh, participated in the creation of the Global Indicator Framework, as well as the 2020 Comprehensive Review, I can tell you that building the Global Indicator Framework was an enormous task. And while undertaking a comprehensive review was perhaps not quite as large as building the framework, it was nonetheless a massive undertaking. And of course, it needs to be done in a methodical manner with clear guidelines and principles. So why do we do a comprehensive re review of the framework every five years? The 2025 comprehensive review it re provides an opportunity to improve the indicator framework to help global monitoring of the 2030 agenda. It offers an opportunity to revise indicators that need tweaking, delete indicators where we have found that there are reporting or methodology issues, and in rare instances, um, add an indicator where there is a major issue. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about the uh, guiding principles for the 2025 review. These principles include the, uh, the following. The review needs to take into account investments already made at the national and international levels and should not undermine ongoing efforts. The revised framework should not significantly impose an additional burden on national statistical work. There should be space for improvements in the global indicator framework, while at the same time ensuring that the changes are limited in scope and the size of the framework remains the same. The focus of the common work of the expert group should remain on the national implementation of the framework um, for the achievement of the SDGs. And I believe we've lost the, the presentation. Um, 
Next slide, please. Um, so we have the specific criteria for um, the implementation of the comprehensive review. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that these are draft uh, criteria and they are subject to modification. An additional indicator may be considered only in very exceptional cases when a crucial aspect of the target is not being monitored by the current indicator or to address a critical or emerging issue um, that is not uh, that has not been monitored by existing indicators. A deletion will be considered when a tier two indicator has not been able to submit data to the global SDG monitoring or has proven to be challenging for countries to implement and a replacement indicator will be proposed if the deleted indicator is the only indicator monitoring the corresponding target. Adjustments or replacements will be considered when the indicator does not map well or does not track to the target well. And the propo any proposed indicator must have an agreed upon methodology and available data um, and be suitable for global monitoring. So what that means is no tier three indicators. Um, and finally, the aim of the review will be to maintain the same, the same number of indicators currently in the framework and to not alter significantly the original framework, which is already being implemented in most countries and does not increase uh, reporting burden on the statistical national statistical systems. Next slide, please. So here are some in additional criteria or considerations for the comprehensive uh, review. That an addition of a sub indicator within an ex existing indicator tier one or tier two is dis discouraged as it adds to the reporting burden. Additionally, any proposal for a replacement or an additional indicator should minimize the use of sub indicators to ensure that the indicator framework does not uh, expand. Um, and the IAG SDGs will cl examine closely all proposals to ensure that the reporting bar burden does not increase as a result of additional sub-indicators. Next slide, please. So let's go through the timeline for the um, comprehensive review. So over the course of 2023, um, the group will share specific criteria for the comprehensive review. So we're going to finalize that. Um, between January and June um, of 2024, the group will undertake a review of the framework, um, uh, noting possible deletions, replacements, adjustments, and additions. In May uh, 2024, all proposals for indicator changes for the 2025 comprehensive review must be submitted to the Secretariat. Between July and August 2024, um, we'll have an open consultation on the preliminary uh, list of the proposal of indicator changes. In September of 2024, the group will review the results of these consultations. And in October, November 2024, at the 15th IAG meeting, the group will review the draft proposal on the indicator uh, changes. And December, we will submit those uh, the final proposal for to the Statistical Commission for the 56th session in March 2025. Next slide, please. Okay, super. That's everything. Um, so we're going to, you've got the timeline, you've got some uh, guiding principles and the draft criteria. Um, and now we're going to talk to a presentation by Yonggi Min of the UN Statistics Division, and she's going to talk about some of the lessons learned from the 2020 Comprehensive Review from the UN perspective. So Yonggi, I'd like to turn it to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kara. So I will share some uh, experience and lesson learned from the 2020 Comprehensive Review. Um, uh, next slide, please. So I will go through the... Um, 2020 uh, comprehensive review process and also show you some of the numbers uh, from the 2020 review and uh, uh, some of the reason and, and certain proposal were not considered and also some key takeaway from uh, the 2020 review. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the in 2020 and uh, so the IAG had a call 
for proposal um, from May to June for three weeks. And uh, uh, then in July, uh, June and the July, uh, so the IED uh, had uh, five weeks continuously, uh, like uh, uh, review all this initial proposal. So the IED met every week for five weeks, went through all the initial proposal and uh, uh, finalized a first round uh, preliminary list of proposal, uh, which is going to uh, send to the open consultation in July and August. So the open consultation I run for five weeks and uh, uh, through the open consultation and, and we receive over 600 comments uh, um, and uh, suggestions. And in September, uh, the IED reviewed uh, the other results from the open consultation and they developed a second list of the proposal. And in October at the 10th IED meeting um, in Alice, the IED uh, revised the list of proposal and uh, uh, then discussed uh, uh, this revised list uh, as a meeting um, in, in the, its closed meeting and also uh, in the open meeting. And in November, the IED finalized uh, uh, the proposal for the 2020 review uh, and then submitted to the commission for its consideration. And so next, I'm going to share uh, you some of the numbers uh, from the 2020 review. Uh, next slide, please. So in total, in 2020, uh, uh, for the from the call for proposal, the IED received 251 proposal, and and uh, the IED had a set of strict criteria. Uh, and and also uh, required documents uh, for uh, submission. So only about 100 of this proposal uh, met the criteria and, and the requirements. And uh, then the IED, after the IET five weeks intensive review, so 53 of this proposed uh, proposal uh, were included in the open consultation. And as I mentioned, um, during the open consultation, uh, we received the five about six hundred uh, um, inputs uh, from uh, like a custodian agency, um, other international and regional organization, from countries, from civil society, academia, and private sectors. And so then, IG uh, conduct an uh, initial review. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, yeah, review the input for the fifty three proposal and decide to consider seven additional proposals that were based on the internal discussion and had been submitted a slide later. And uh, at the tenth uh, meeting, and um, the IED agreed on a set of proposal for consideration of the statistical commission at its 51st session in March 2020. Uh, the final proposal included 36 major changes uh, to uh, the framework uh, in the form of replacements, revision, additions, deletion, and also uh, around the 20 minor refinements. So the 36 uh, major changes uh, to the global framework included 14 proposal for the replacement of existing indicators, eight proposal for the revision of existing indicators, and eight proposal for additional indicators, and the six proposal for the deletion of existing indicators. So uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, there are about four types of proposal. Or, uh, the first type is a re replacement of uh, existing indicator. And the second is a revision of existing indicator. Uh, replacement is a totally different indicator. Revision and means a, a major uh, like a methodology change uh, of existing indicator. And uh, then additional indicator that's uh, uh, and then deletion of existing indicator. There's a four type of uh, uh, Proposal that uh, are included in the uh, com comprehensive review. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So the IED also required uh, uh, some detailed submission 
criteria for replacement adjustments and additional indicator in the 2020 review. Uh, so each submission must include all of this information listed below. If each item listed below is not included in the submission, the IG uh, didn't consider the proposal. Uh, the included should include an indicator, uh, submission should include an indicator proposal summary uh, uh, using a template provided and no more than two pages that uh, uh, required information are uh, the background and the rationale for the indicator proposal. Information on how and when the methodology has become an international standard and who is a governing body that approved uh, the international standard. And what's the, what are the data sources and the, the data availability. And uh, also a detailed metadata should be provided followed in the metadata template. And, and we also require to provide the available data and the link to where the data can be located. And also require the data availability should cover at least the 30% of country and of population across uh, the different region um, where the indicator is relevant. And also propose, uh, send a plan for how the data coverage will be expanded if current data coverage is below 50%. And also other, uh, any other methodological documents or links to these documents. So this is a, a very detailed requirement for any proposal. Next slide, please. So uh, this is uh, some of the reasons that uh, uh, the certain proposal were not included uh, or considered. So of the 251 proposal received uh, during the open consultation, um, nearly half were not considered because the, they either uh, did not meet the specific criteria set by the IETSDG or the submission were, uh, were missing uh, the required documents. Um, during the open call for proposal, the guiding principles and the specific criteria uh, were clearly listed. So furthermore, uh, the, the UNSD also shared detailed guidelines on the supporting documents that needed to be submitted with the proposal. So many uh, proposals uh, were disregarded, for instance, for instance, simply because they did not include the metadata file with the submission as required by these guidelines. And 35 of the proposal uh, that were received were a suggestion for minor refinement of the indicators um, that uh, are usually handled by the IET annually uh, uh, when they happen and uh, which uh, has a separate pro process. Um, so the other proposal that the IET uh, decided now to consider uh, share um, share some common uh, characteristics. Some of the proposal for major changes uh, in indicators either receive strong opposition or fail to uh, gather support from the custody agencies. These proposals tend to come from civil society or some NSOs. Um, so uh, their chance of success may have uh, uh, improved if they made effort to discuss and coordinate with custody agency for a specific indicator propose uh, uh, before developing the proposal. In some in instances, uh, relevant stakeholder should also be consulted. Um, so for, for example, one proposal was not considered because of the stakeholder group uh, expressed deep concern on the proposed uh, additions. And some indicator was simply very similar uh, with other proposal that were submitted during the open consultation. And for this reason, uh, were considered, considered redundant. Um, certain targets already had multiple indicator to monitor them. For the majority of this instance, the idea failed that the target were already adequate could adequately measured and uh, did not consider any proposal to add indicators. And, and uh, uh, sometimes the proposal 
uh, were similar to or highly correlated with existing indicator. So the IAG also uh, did not consider uh, this in uh, proposals. And uh, lastly, uh, some proposal for additional indicator uh, were good in series, but uh, because data for such indicators would be extremely hard to obtain or for certain country to collect, so the IAG weighted uh, the practicality of adding such indicator and concluded uh, they were not uh, uh, feasible. Uh, so this is some of the reason that uh, in 2020 review and uh, the IAG, uh, the reason that uh, the proposal was not considered. Next slides, please. Uh, here are some of the key uh, takeaway. Um, so do remember that uh, the global indicator framework is designed, sorry, mistake, it's designed to provide a global overview of the progress on SDGs. So um, proposal for global monitoring requires an internationally uh, agreed methodology, a good coverage of data and the custodian agency. Um, do strictly follow the specific criteria and the submission requirement. Uh, attention to detail matters and the incomplete submission of those that did not meet the criteria will be disregarded uh, in the first round of uh, uh, review. And, and do consult with relevant custody agency uh, where possible. A proposal is unlikely to be considered if it's a face strong opposition from the custody agency. And do have a, a look at the global indicator framework as a whole. Uh, indicators are complementary and interdependent. Consider how your proposal will impact the framework. Will they uh, repeat something that already exists? Will they significantly expand the size of the framework? Will they be easy or practical to implement? Um, so the, do not think the exclusion of a proposal implies that the issue of the indicator in question is less important uh, than others. Um, the IAG has always stated that it's intent to make limited changes to the framework. So as now to disrupt existing monitoring efforts and to acknowledge investments already made at the national, regional, and global level, the IG attempt to ensure the balance across the goals and targets of the 2030 agenda. Um, so indicator that not included still have a value, valuable role to play in the follow-up and review process on the SDG through national, regional, and the semantic monitor, and can provide important additional information and can complement the global indicator framework. So here are uh, some of the uh, key takeaway. Um, I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. Oh, back to you, Sarah, Cara. Thank you very much, Yongi. Um, I think the, the key takeaways is a really important slide. Um, and maybe we can keep that. Um, and when we go start to go through our process, we can have that um, as some, some um, guidance for, for um, organizations or countries that wish to um, submit uh, proposals for the 2025 comprehensive review because I think that's really important. So now we're going to go to um, WHO's uh, experience for the 2020 comprehensive review and to um, take us on their journey it's Steve McFeely um, who's going to walk us through um, how WHO handled the 2020 comprehensive review and any other thoughts that Steve might have on the upcoming review. So over to you, Steve. Right, thanks, Cara. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody, wherever you are. <clears throat> so first of all, just before I begin, I, I would like to just put on record um, our thanks to the IAG STG um, for their professionalism and cooperation um, over the, the last couple of years. And I say this both on behalf of the WHO, but also on behalf as, as a co-chair of the CCSA or the chief statisticians of the international system. Uh, we enjoy a very good working relationship with the IAG and it's, it's very much appreciated. From a WHO perspective, 
it's particularly um, appreciated because we, we understand as a specialised agency that we, we place an additional burden on the IAG. Um, most national statistical offices don't have health or medical um, experience and knowledge uh, in-house, which means there's an additional burden having to, to liaise with ministries um, and get, get, get expert advice. So we, we understand that, that this adds a burden. So again, our, our heartfelt thanks um, for, for doing this. But from our experience, looking back at both the 2020 review and the, the kind of interim reviews, what we what we see is that the IAG SDG has typically understood the epidemiological or the statistical issues and methods um, in proposed indicators, but maybe the IAG has struggled to understand maybe some of the subject content and some of the context. Um, and as someone relatively new to WHO, I, I can completely empathize with this with this challenge. So I, I think a lesson for us at WHO, looking back at the 2020 review, is that we need to make much greater efforts um, to bridge that knowledge gap and make sure that we can provide a better sense of content and context so that the IAG members can understand why we're saying what we're saying and why it's so important. Nevertheless, despite these challenges, in our assessment, the IAG SDG has understood both the strengths and the limitations of the health indicators that we've put forward. So this hasn't been a, an, an insurmountable challenge. Um, as, as a slight aside, um, another challenge we have with the SDG indicators more broadly is that the shelf life or the, the life of the SDGs is much narrower and for a lot of health indicators we meet, we need a much longer time horizon um, to, to really assess um, progress. So if you're looking at the implications of antimicrobial resistance or malnutrition, you really need a long time horizon. And, and that's no criticism of the IAG, that, that's just, um, it's just an outcome of the, the, the 15 year life cycle that we face. Now, that said, when we look back at the 2020 review, WHO faced um, some challenges or, or, or some failures, if you want, um, that were disappointing both to WHO and also to our colleagues in UNICEF. And that may have reflected misunderstandings um, or maybe also just as, as Young E meant, mentioned, also I think we suffered given the size constraints of the global indicator framework. So let, let me give you an, a, an example. So WHO and UNICEF together had jointly proposed three indicators relating to target 2.2. And the, the indicators we'd proposed were low birth weight, uh, anemia in women and exclusive breastfeeding. And the reason we propose three indicators is that this malnutrition is, is a complex topic and it, and it differs depending on which part of the life cycle that you're looking at. So indicators for children may not be appropriate to, to, add, uh, to indicators for adults. And there is a clear gender issue as well, um, especially for women of fertile age. So that, that, that was the logic, and, and that was particularly important, um, as I said, both to WHO and both to UNICEF to try and bring a holistic, holistic view. But for example, exclusive breastfeeding uh, wasn't, wasn't accepted. And I, I guess disappointingly for us, some of the feedback that we got is that this indicator was seen by some member states as, as being political and that was especially disappointing because the, the scientific benefits of, of breastfeeding are, I think are clear and undisputed. So that, that, that was, that, that was uh, particularly kind of difficult. Um, and again, in a case like that, I, I think it's particularly important, certainly if we look at lessons for the future, that any rationale around decisions um, is communicated um, clearly because it was, it was quite difficult then to go back to WHO and, and explain that. Um, low, base, low birth weight um, equally wasn't accepted. I think in this case, it was easier to understand in that the reason given was that, that there was basically competition. That, as Yangi mentioned, there was, there was a surplus of indicators 
And perhaps it was felt there was also some correlation uh, between anemia and um, low birth weight. Now, WHO would contest that, but nevertheless, I think that that, that was key. it was easier to understand um, the logic. It's still disappointing uh, from a, a public health perspective. And I think that's really one of the challenges, um, as Yanni just mentioned, is, is the purpose of the global indicator framework is really looking at the, the, the universe of development rather than, in WHO's case, uh, public health. And that's not always well understood. And, it, and, and I think certainly for custodian agencies as well as the IAG, I think that's a, a message that's really, really important to communicate. Um, and, and I think it's very important to communicate that as well with between the NSOs and the ministries, because I think there are tensions there um, sometimes. Now, what's next? Um, so, yeah, so when we look back at the, the comprehensive review, I mean, again, we would just like to express our thanks. Um, we, we got a lot of good feedback from the IAG, and, and that helped us to make um, important developments and improvements uh, in our indicators. In particular, in the subsequent years be, between the, the last review and now, we, we've managed to change, with, with the cooperation of the IAG, uh, a couple of indicators and amend them slightly. And those amendments have been really, really important from our perspective in that they've led to what we would see as very important improvements in the indicator um, that we now have. So quickly look into the future. Um, so at the moment, WHO is preparing for the forthcoming 2025 comprehensive review. And um, we've already got comments from the IAG, for example, on the universal health coverage uh, service coverage index. Um, and, and I think those comments were valid. Um, and, and we're now that those comments are now guiding the current development work. And we also got some feedback at the recent meeting in Bangkok. And again, that's been very, very helpful to us. Um, Broadening the discussion beyond health, I mean, WHO, like several other international organizations, does have some fears or concerns looking forward, especially around uh, existing tier two indicators. Um, several of these have been constructed over the last few years. They've been developed conceptually. There's a lot of work has gone into that. Um, and I, again, just fears that eviction, if I can call it that, from the, the global indicator framework in, in 2025 would be disappointing, but it may also inadvertently set, send some easily misunderstood messages. And Yangi alluded to this in just what does exclusion mean? I mean, she, she was very clear that exclusion doesn't mean anything about the indicator or about the topic. But that's often misunderstood. And in fact, even within WHO, we, again, we see the importance of internal communications between the statistical community and WHO and the, the topic specialists. As I don't think even now everybody still understands well the role of the global indicator framework. And there's still a lot of expectations around the, the coming comprehensive review. And what we're trying to manage expectations about what that what around the opportunities that, that this comprehensive review um, actually means. Because we see a lot of indicators are political. Um, they're brought by member states. And oftentimes those, the ministries in those member states aren't communicating with their own statistics office. And expectations can be very, very high. Um, so quickly to conclude, from a WHO perspective, I, I think we've learned the lesson that we need to be much more prepared communicating with the IAG, particularly in our case as a specialized agency with context and content so that the IAG members can understand the non-statistical arguments and elements. And then again, just equally, um, the, the more clear that the IAG are both on rules, guidelines, deadlines, any changes to those to the custodian agencies is super helpful. And again, when the decisions or feedback come after the decision kind of the more the more kind of content we can get around those decisions that will just help us with our own constituents so with that um, i'll stop thank you 
Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I think there were some really useful lessons for the IAG members to um, take to heart as we start the 2025 comprehensive review. Um, I think maybe maybe seeking some clarity on things uh, prior to making uh, the decisions is is a great uh, a great thing that we can do. And thanks to you um, and all of the um, other custodian agencies. Um, I think the relationship between NSOs and, and custodian agencies has improved so much. And, you know, we're all trying to move to the same um, and achieve the same thing. So um, thanks to you and, and all of CCS for, for the help um, in kind of getting us all on the right track. Um, so now we're going to talk um, to one of the IAG members. Um, and as many of you know, the IAG members go through a rotation. Um, and Brazil is one of the very few current IAG members that was involved in the 2020 Comprehensive Review. So Denise Kromenberger from Brazil is going to walk us through the member state consultation process. So Denise, over to you. Thank you very much, Kara. I'm sharing my screen. Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning from Brazil. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm Denise Cronenberger. I'm the head of the institutional relations in the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics, IBGE. And I'm going to present the experience of the IBGE throughout the 2020 Comprehensive Review. This slide shows a short timeline to contextualize my presentation and highlight the importance of linking the activities conducted in a global level with regional and national levels. Brazil attended all steps of the process and made consultations based on this timeline. How did we conduct consultations with neighboring countries on the proposals? We used the structure of ING representations in sub-regions. Brazil and Colombia as members of ING SDG representing South American countries decided to work together Brazil represents Chile and Mercosur countries, and Colombia represents the Andes region. What was the motivation to work together? The need of more participation from our represented countries to have a common vision as a region to attend the ING discussions. What uh, mechanisms were applied by Colombia and Brazil. We held a virtual meeting on the 6th of May 2019 to discuss the coordination mechanisms at the regional level, identified some proposals that we could jointly promote as a region, and above all discuss the 2020 comprehensive review. Notice that in, in the timeline, notes that in May the 2020 comprehensive review was launched in an ING homepage. And we have held other bilateral meetings. And Brazil and Colombia identified the focal points in the NSOs of each of the sub regions that we represented. The people who were chosen as the spokespersons for the countries participated in the discussions on the SDG indicators. We also established protocols for the presentation of joint positions before the ING meetings. Uh, and after the next slide, um, after the initial activities that I showed you in the previous slide, Brazil and Colombia held um, virtual meetings with represented countries and continued the interactions by emails. Uh, the UN uh, environment contributed with the discussions and the ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, we, we had the support from these institutions to elaborate 
proposals for additional indicators. And in this slide, you can see the indicator proposed from uh, Brazil and Colombia for the target 3.7 about maternity in adolescence, for the target 4.3 uh, about tertiary education, and for the target 12.5 about recycle waste. This slide shows the template proposal summary uh, and metadata draft template. One of the criteria for the comprehensive review of the indicators was that the proposed indicators must have an agreed methodology, available data, and be suitable for global monitoring. In this context, it was very important to have these templates to organize the information about the proposed indicators that enable us to sort out which ones were actually relevant. I'd like to point out that Brazil takes part in the Statistical Coordination Group for the 23rd Agenda in Latin America and the Caribbean, coordinated by the ECLAC. And we received support from the SDG team at ECLAC in our joint work with Colombia. For the next comprehensive review, we'll be easier than during the 2020 review because we will have the collaborative platform of the Statistical Coordination Group for the 23rd Agenda in Latin America and the Caribbean. It was developed by the ECLAC to support the activities of the group. In national level, how did we conduct national consultations? using the national coordination mechanisms that we have been using to produce SDG indicators. The IBGE presidency is responsible for the coordination of the SDG indicators project. I'm the general coordinations. Uh, we have two coordinators for each SDG and the support of seven units at IBGE. There are about 50 people attending this project. Also, we created interinstitutional working groups for each SDG under the coordination at IBGE. They have been discussing the global SDG indicators methodology applied to Brazil and producing them. During the period of 2020 re review, we received contributions from several institutions, such as the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Science and Technology, the Ministry of Agriculture, and so on. This slide shows one example of the consultation flow in Brazil. We can see the different levels where the national statistical offices act in 23rd Agenda, global, regional, and national level. In a global level, the custodian agencies sent the proposals during 2020 comprehensive review to the Secretariat of ING, which sent them to the ING member countries. I have been representing the IBGE in, in ING, and when I received the consultations, I sent them to my SDG coordinators, who sent the demand to our partner institutions. In this case, in this example, Otavio, the coordinator of the SDG 12, sent the demands to the Ministry of Agriculture and Embrapa. In the same way, the regional consultations followed the flows that started in a global level by using the mechanisms that I mentioned before. 100 uh, 
about né? about 100 and proposals were received during the open call that took place in the first half of June 2019. Out of those proposals, 92 met the criteria established by the ING SDGs, such as having an agreed methodology, available data and suitability for global monitoring. In this part of the process, Brazil sent comments on 66 indicators. Why did we not send contributions for all indicators? Because we had some challenges throughout the process. In 2019, we had some focal point changes in our partner institutions due to shifts in the central government. So, changes in focal points and the orientations contributed with ruptures and delays, which means less participation. I'd like to highlight in this slide the importance of using the column code by the Secretariat of IND for indicator proposals received throughout the open call. Each color means the situation of the indicator. The blue, the blue color, for example, was used for targets that IND identified as possibly needing additional indicators. The color code was a very good support for analysis, and we recommend it is used again in the next comprehensive review. Brazil also took part in the review of open consultation proposals made in September and October 2019, rating on a scale of one to five our opinion on each of the proposals. Brazil scored about 79 indicators. Uh, and uh, ING reviewed 36 indicators with proposals of refinements in October 2019. Brazil sent comments for 89% of the indicators. After finishing the process, we incorporated the changes into Brazilian SDG platform by using the worksheet with the most recent tier classification, which is another important reference document. So, finishing my presentation, the lessons learned and the recommendations that I'd like to emphasize here are the leadership of NSO is very important because NSOs play a key role in measuring the achievement of the SDGs. Uh, to have this uh, governance structure in uh, not only in national statistical offices, but also in other national information producers, uh, to, to have the focal points responsible for the SDG is very important to conduct the, the process of the comprehensive review. The cooperation between NSOs and the other government data producers is uh, fundamental to, to organize the collaborations. I also highlight as lessons learned the importance of the participation of represented countries in ING and to have updated national focal points with the support of the ECLAC, the UN Regional Commission. We need more time to conduct the next comprehensive review to ensure greater stakeholder participation. So my, in my point of view, it's one, uh, one of the recommendations. And the use of templates for indicator proposals was a positive initiative, as I mentioned before. It is fundamental to plan the national consultations and the consultations in countries we represent in ING according to the timeline to organize the process in national and regional levels. So thank you very much for your attention and thank, thanks for the invitation for, uh, made by the UNCD. 
Thank you so much, Denise. Um, I think you showed just how complex it is um, undertaking the consultations for the comprehensive review, not only for within your country, but also for the countries that you represent um, for the IEAG. Um, and I also think the ECLAC um, board um, or site where you can have the collaboration amongst countries in the region on, on proposals is a fantastic idea. Um, and your lessons learned slide is going to be one that that I I'm going to harness and use um, as we start the consultation project uh, process within Canada. So um, thank you very much for that. Um, our next uh, panelist is uh, Clara Vanderpol from UNWTO, and she's going to talk to us about preparation for the 2025 review for um, the possibility of having an indicator ready for target 8.9. So Clara, please over to you. Thank you very much, um, Kara, and thank you very much to the interagency and expert group for having me here today. Um, um, like Steve, we need to uh, express our profound gratitude from the World Tourism Organization for this opportunity and also for the very good um, dialogue and collaboration that we're having with the uh, interagency expert group when it comes to the tourism SDG indicator. So thank you very much um, to the whole group. And it has been indeed a monumental task that you've been carrying on. <laughs> and so thank you very much for all the wonderful work. Um, let's get started. The next slide, please. My presentation will be structured as follows. Um, I'll give an overview of the current tourism SDG indicators for which UNWTO is custodian agency. I'll touch upon some of the outstanding issues and the reason for why preparations are now underway for the 2025 comprehensive review. Um, next, we'll see some of the steps forward that are being proposed considering the interagency and SDG principles and criteria that of course still need to be um, um, finalized, but already considering uh, what, uh, what, um, what might be uh, decided. And finally, a way forward that aligns with, uh, with um, interagency specified timeline for this uh, review. Next slide, please. So where do we stand with regards to the tourism SDG indicators? Next slide, please. So UNWTO is custodian agency of two SDG indicators included in the global um, indicator framework. These are um, indicator 8.91 on tourism direct gross domestic product, which helps to monitor target 8.9, which calls on countries to promote sustainable tourism and is situated under goal eight on decent work and economic growth. This indicator also helps to monitor um, target 14.7, which calls to by 2030, increase the economic benefits to SIDS and LDCs from the sustainable use of marine resources, including through sustainable management of fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism. So it's, an, it's a nice versatile indicator in this sense. And then we also have indicator 12.B1, which shows the preparedness of countries to develop and implement tools to monitor sustainable development impacts for sustainable tourism, uh, which is what target 12.B calls for under goal 12 on sustainable consumption and production. Now, more specifically, this indicator tracks the implementation in countries of a tourism satellite accounts and the system of environmental and economic accounting, those tables that are most relevant to the understanding of uh, sustainability and tourism. Now, data collection for both of these indicators started in 2019, and yearly data is available from 2008 onwards, available on UNWTO's website and also on the Global SDG uh, database. Next slide, please. So what are some of the outstanding issues that motivate the preparations for the 2025 comprehensive review? Next slide, please. They relate to the fact that uh, the monitoring of targets 8.9, which states that by 2030, to devise and implement policies to promote sustainable tourism that creates jobs and promotes local culture and products. And currently, of course, the only indicator to monitor this is um, tourism direct GDP. This is the share of gross domestic product that is directly attributable to tourism. So some of the outstanding issues um, with respect to this indicator is that while this is a very good indicator and does a very good job of tracking 
the level of promotion in sustainable tourism. Sustainable tourism is in fact composed of three dimensions, right? The economic, the social, and the environmental. And target 8.91 only covers the economic one. Second, there is another crucial aspect of the target that is not being monitored, which is sustainable tourism that creates jobs. And third, there's the emerging issue brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic that emphasized the importance of employment in tourism as a principal vehicle whereby tourism sustains livelihoods and environmental protection in both developing and developed countries alike. Next slide, please. Now, these are not new issues. Um, and they have been present also before the COVID-19 pandemic. And in fact, countries um, before the pandemic had already expressed their thoughts um, and concerns to the UN Statistical Commission and also to the UN WTO Committee um, on Statistics, which is the official body that reports to UN WTO's decision-making organs, um, on the need to complement tourism direct GDP with, uh, with other measures to uh, have a better understanding of the sustainability of tourism. And so um, in the 2020 comprehensive review, the following was proposed. You will see it on the slide. And in order to cover the social dimension of sustainability, um, the replacement of the indicator that was there at the time, that was 8.92 on the proportion of jobs in sustainable tourism industries out of total tourism jobs, which was in principle not measurable and also conceptually um, challenging. It was proposed to look at number of employees in tourism industries for which there is an internationally agreed methodology and also data available in many countries. And to cover the environmental dimension to add an indicator on energy use by the tourism industries. Now the results of the open consultation were fairly positive, but in the end, both proposals were not taken on board. And we fully understand also the rationale of the interagency um, expert group in taking that decision. Next slide, please. Now, as mentioned, um, the UN Statistical Commission took this, um, took this matter quite seriously. And over the past um, two commission meetings, there was a very constructive um, decisions taking. So for example, in, 2000, um, in 2022, the Statistical Commission requested the interagency expert group to work in coordination with the custodian agency on proposals for indicators to better monitor target 8.9 and also encourage the finalization of the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism um, for its submission to the commission. And the year before, the decisions were also in the same spirit. We have um, requested the interagency expert group to closely work with the custodian agencies for indicators on sustainable tourism and also welcome the update provided on the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism. So on both occasions, the commission um, hints at the developments, the conceptual developments on measuring the sustainability of tourism um, framework as a way forward. Next slide, please. So let's have a look at what this precisely means. Next slide. Um, the program for measuring the sustainability of tourism is outlined on this slide and it consists of various lines of work. Um, so UNWTO works in partnership with the UN Statistics Division, leading countries, also with the support of the International Labor Organization and others to develop a statistical framework. This is a very technical task, of course, but it also involves engagement and consensus building across the various stakeholder groups. So there's, of course, the community of tourism statisticians, tourism accountants, but also tourism policymakers and tourism stakeholders to ensure that this framework is not only technically and conceptually sound, but also responds to actual information needs um, by the countries. Um, the work also involves implementation in countries, and the testing of the framework through pilots, um, and also the development of a set of indicators that can be derived from this conceptual framework. And as part of this, liaising with the interagency expert group. Of course, the end objective is to come up with an international data set on sustainable tourism uh, for country level reporting. Next slide, please. So this is an overview, a visual overview of the framework under development. You will see the three dimensions and you will see uh, for example, things like water and energy use, solid waste. On the economic dimension, of course, we have tourism GDP and business demographics. And on the social dimension, there are things like employment and education and skills. 
Now, all of these indicators can potentially complement current indicator <coughs> 8.91 um, towards in GDP. Now, data availability here is likely to be the crucial consideration, uh, considering that conceptual precision and, um, and um, responsiveness to the target is already being met. Next slide, please. A brief word on the institutional setup of this work. Um, so both the development of the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism and the indicators that are thereof derived is sort of nested between two core stakeholder groups. On the one hand, we have the ministries in charge of tourism in countries. And on the other hand, we also have the national statistical offices. Um, UNWTO has set up a special working group of experts to lead this development that is um, under the auspices of the UNWTO Committee on Statistics that I mentioned before. And this body reports both to UNWTO's governing organs and also to the UN Statistical Commission. In the middle, you will see some um, a selection of policy instruments that have recognized this development. So we see the European Parliament Resolution on Sustainable Tourism, G20 Leaders Declarations, um, but also regional efforts such as the Pacific Tourism Policy Framework and its statistical framework um, that is based on MST. Next slide, please. So the steps forward. Next slide, please. Um, so there is a task team on sustainable tourism that has been set up by the interagency expert group. And um, this is working quite nicely. UNWTO has been invited to join this group. Um, and as shown on the slide, the mandate of the group is to discuss, build consensus, and develop a detailed proposal for sustainable tourism indicators to better monitor target 8.9. Now, the idea is to have a proposal ready on time for the 2025 comprehensive review. Next slide, please. And this is an overview of the steps that will be taken. In purple, we can see the activities um, that are being led by the task team. In red, those that are being led by the interagency. And the rest are activities uh, carried out by UNWTO, considering, of course, the interagency and the task team timelines. We'll see that in the last quarter of last year, UNWTO reviewed, we made a big review of international, national, and subnational indicator initiatives on sustainable tourism and prepared an analysis of the most widely used indicators. Um, this helps to ensure that the framework um, adequately responds to user needs while supporting international comparability. And based on this, a list of 10 to 15 indicators is being prepared for consideration by the task team um, um, an important consideration, as mentioned before, will be data availability um, and, of course, responsiveness to the target. Um, this list is currently being um, considered by the Bureau of UNWTO's Committee on Statistics, and it's expected that in February, uh, end of February, uh, we will be able to submit this to the task team on sustainable tourism, which will screen, search, and select indicators and prepare a draft proposal. The task team has planned a consultation process for the draft proposal to be held in the first quarter of 2024. And in parallel to this, of course, at UNWTO, we're continuing the finalization of the statistical framework for measuring the sustainability of tourism, that the plan is to submit it to the UN Statistical Commission um, for its endorsement in 2024. Now, this fits nicely the whole process, also designed by the interagency um, expert group, um, and so in May, as identified, um, the idea is to submit the final proposal for sustainable tourism indicators to the interagency expert group on time to feed the comprehensive review. Um, with this, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much and happy to engage in the conversation. Super. Thank you so much, Clara, um, for walking us through that. Um, and the IAG is excited to um, fill this um, hole and be ready for the comprehensive review with um, a sustainable tourism indicator. So thank you very much for, for walking us through that. Um, so now we're going to move to the panel um, portion of, of the, our discussion. And so this is when, if you have questions, start typing them in the chat. Um, and I'd also like to invite um, another IAG member 
uh, Sweden, and Sweden was the Miss Sarah Frankel. Sorry, uh, uh, Sarah. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to joining us here. And Sarah, uh, Sweden was the chair of the IAG SDGs during the 2020 Comprehensive Review. So Sarah, can you share with us your thoughts on the process and how you manage the Comprehensive Review within Sweden? How did you consult? Was there anything you would do differently or any recommendations you can make to other countries who have not gone through this process before? Um, do you have any suggestions that you would give to international organizations hoping to propose modifications to SDG indicators? Um, that's a really big question. So take whatever component of that you want and, and run, through, run uh, with it. So thank you very much, Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Kira. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the time here because we want to have some discussion as well. So I'm going to try to be a, a bit brief, but um, uh, starting off, Good afternoon from Stockholm. Um, I've been involved in the work of the indicators and statistics uh, for SDGs from the start, I'd say. Uh, I was not sort of the member of the IEEG um, from the beginning, but I followed it closely through my colleague Vivica Palm, who was the chair of the IEEG during the comprehensive review, where Vivica now works in Eurostat, and I believe she's in the meeting today. So hi, Vivica. <laughs> it's been it's been super interesting to hear um, uh, the presentations today, and I will try to share some of my reflections on the 2020 uh, review and the lessons learned, and and looking ahead to, towards uh, the the um, uh, 2024 comprehensive review. So how we managed it, um, since we were involved in the setting up of the system, I think we had a pretty clear picture of the areas where uh, where the work of finding areas, uh, finding indicators had been particularly difficult. In some cases, there had been suggestions and discussions within the IEG uh, already uh, about what might be used as proxies, for example. And sometimes countries had added their own indicators to cover areas that, that uh, also um, and that also served as input. And and since it takes quite some time to create indicators that have good definitions and and uh, where data is available um, uh, for the global follow up, the review I think um, was somewhat mainly about summing up ongoing initiatives um to make the the, the follow-up as good as possible uh, now we had a couple of priorities from sweden that we sort of kept an eye on it was antibiotics and greenhouse um, gas emissions but i think that those were discussed within the ieg uh, already before the comprehensive review uh, so that was just we had those uh, we had those um priorities and we, we kept an eye on them sort of from the Swedish perspective. Um, our national coordination process was much more informal than the one that Denise presented. I applaud you, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we um, we there was there were no proposals uh, for indicators from Sweden as a country. Although there were experts involved in proposals from CSO and UNA agencies and, and international organizations, and we provided advice uh, to Swedish ex experts mainly uh, um, on how to proceed with proposals and, and uh, uh, things like that when we were asked. And, and we were asked quite a bit actually on sort of how to navigate uh, this process. And then regarding the open consultation, we sent out the information about the consultation, but we did not really coordinate a, a reply from the government. So it was sent out to, to, to um, uh, ministries and, and organizations for them to reply to. And from Statistics Sweden's point of view, uh, we did have a coordinated reply and we started out sort of in, in our knowledge of the existing data needs and 
we're in contact with experts when we needed explanations and, and more thorough um, sort of investigation of the proposed indicators. Uh, we also represent the Nordic countries in the AIEG, uh, and that coordination is also very informal. We're five experts um, that know each other well and are basically constantly in touch. And especially during those first five years of the framework's existence, I would say. So we informed uh, the other countries about the timelines and such, and then we had ongoing uh, conversations about issues. Um, and also, the EU coordination means that we're often quite updated on issues that might be of interest, of interest for, for all the EU and EFTA countries. I think when it, uh, regarding things that uh, you might uh, do differently, um, I think uh, that we will uh, try to be more or even more clear on the criteria and perhaps point out more clearly or sort of point to more clearly proposals for deletions uh, to particular groups of people uh, just to, to avoid the, all the upset phone calls, as, as many of those upset phone calls as possible, sort of after the fact. Um, and one lesson is that we, I think we do not always understand all the issues surrounding the indicators and the, the, the motivations behind the indicators. Um, so that could be something or the, some things that are not super statistical. So seeking the advice on those issues uh, could be something to, to work on for the next um, um, round of, of uh, um, review. Um, and I think for the for the coming period, there should be some still some gaps to fill. And, and it is a chance to sum up the developments uh, so far or since last time and and perhaps uh, Add things um, or revise things that, that where we have had um, important uh, developments, and, and I think that Kara, you also mentioned Yongi's last slide on, on slide on on key takeaways. I, I think that is super important, and that's also something that we have communicated to people throughout the years. Uh, when we've had questions on the process and if changes to the framework is possible. So I really want to strongly emphasize those same points. Um, follow the cr criteria, consult with custodian agencies and look at the framework as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, great way to kick us off with our, our questions. Um, I, I think what we'll start with is I'm going to uh, throw a question over to Steve from WHO. Um, and then I'm going to look at the questions in the chat. I haven't had a chance to look at, at what's in the chat, so I'll look at what's in the chat. But um, first to Steve, um, we had a question when people registered. Um, they could pose questions. And so here's one to you. Um, interested in opportunities to strengthen UH, UHC service coverage index, PHC, and how these could possibly be reflected in the indicators. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak to that, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Cara. So UHC means universal health coverage. And the idea of this composite indicator, it's, it's supposed to reflect the idea that everybody has access to the healthcare they need when they need it without financial, without incurring financial hardship. So it's a very, very aspirational um, objective. PHC is primary healthcare. So within the, the, the kind of the economics of health, the, the logic is that primary healthcare, if you can put in place good primary healthcare, that's the first step on the road towards universal health coverage. So in other words, without primary health care, you'll never achieve um, universal health coverage. Now the current index, which is we're currently reviewing, uh, owing to the, the feedback from the, the IAG, the current construction doesn't look at the stages 
of um, of health coverage. What it does is it looks at different types of health coverage. So one of the things that we're doing, we're just in fact about to open an internal conceptual review, and one of the things we'll be doing is trying to see can we include PHC as a pillar into the UHC index. It's not immediately clear to me that we can, or at least. It's not immediately clear that we can in a tidy way where it'll be obvious that PHC is there, um, but it may be there indirectly through through different indicators. So th the short answer is it, it's on our agenda. It's one of the things that we're looking at. It's not immediately obvious how to do it, uh, but it's one of the, it's definitely one of the things that we're looking at in this conceptual review. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Certainly, primary, primary health care is a, an issue in Canada right now. Um, and in Ireland. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. I'm just going to um, read a comment um, from Sayonara in the in the chat here. Um, and I think it's, it's a good one for the IAG members to take to heart. Um, she notes, I wonder if there's a compilation with specific areas which have been identified by the IAG and or custodian agencies as in critical need of review, both from a data availability and from a target coverage gap perspective. Such mapping could be helpful for stakeholders to focus their efforts in coordination with custodian agencies and other stakeholders. Um, it's a really good suggestion, as Yongi has noted, Sayonara. Um, I can tell you that really early on, um, the IEAG um, did a, uh, looked at all of the targets and, and noted where there were gaps um, for the indicators. But as you may recall, some of those targets have multiple dimensions. And if we looked at every single gap that might be in them, we would probably have an indicator framework of about 700 indicators. But there could be key areas um, where there are gaps and there could again, a indeed be some, some data issues in some of the other ones. So I think it's a really good suggestion. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Denise, I'd like to throw a question over to you. Um, what would you say the role of statistics is in achieving SDGs and what could be the com uh, contribution that statisticians make to, um, to realize this? It's a complex. Statistics at global, regional, national and subnational levels play a key role in achieving the 2030 agenda because they are the basis to produce the indicators for the SDG follow up and review. So the statistics make the agenda more concrete uh, that you, you can see the numbers and the analysis of the indicators and you see the, the agenda in, in practice, practice. A wide range of stakeholders use information generated by st statistics to make choices and take decisions. Uh, in relation to the second question, what should be sta statistician contribution to, to realize it for the SDG monitoring, the key hole of the statistician is to provide quality, the high quality data and the statistics joined with other specialized uh, professionals to produce indicators. Um, they can support uh, the integrated analysis and to contribute with innovative solutions to fill the data gaps. This is the, the, the key role of the statistician. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Denise. Indeed, wouldn't it have been great if statisticians were in the room when the targets were developed so that we could have said, okay, you're never going to be able to measure that. Or, or maybe you could frame it this way and we might be able to measure that. Um, so um, I, think, I think that's uh, something that, you know, if we come up on another agenda, perhaps a, a statistician or two could be in, in the room to provide potentially a little bit of direction on what's measurable and what is not measurable. Clara, um, I'd like to ask you, um, you kind of touched a bit on this um, about lessons learned in the 2020 comprehensive review. Um, certainly from the IAG perspective, I can tell you the IAG members learned a lot 
Um, but what would you say a key lesson for a custodian agency from the 2020 uh, comprehensive review would be? And what would be your key takeaway from the 2020 comprehensive review? Mm. Thank you very much, um, Kara. So indeed, I think we, we all learned a tremendous amount from the from the previous comprehensive review. And I think there is a there's a wonderful group of people willing to learn from those um, from those experiences moving forward. Um, if I may use a quote by Joseph Stiglitz, um, what we measure affects what we do. And if we measure the wrong thing, we will do the wrong thing. So I think that is a that is a key perhaps uh, idea to keep in mind as we move um, as we move forward. Um, so of course, we need a very rigorous conceptual underpinning, statistic um, and conceptual underpinnings to all of the indicators. But we also cannot lose sight that the indicators need to be feasible in a vast majority of countries and that they need to be relevant to the policy side. So ensuring this link between the statistical communities and the and the users of this information right so the targets are there for a purpose right and so the indicators are there to serve those targets if those targets made it into the into the political process right it means that those are those are those are elements worth uh worth measuring and um and um and that respond to actual um policy um, priorities in the country so ensuring that we don't lose sight of why, uh, of why we're doing this effort. And of course, maintaining a positive collaboration and dialogue uh, going on, putting in value also, as Steve mentioned earlier, the subject matter expertise. Um, you know, the statistical community is very, very broad. We know that the interagency has done, you know, a monumental task and it was a very complex effort. And moving forward, it would be, uh, it would be indeed beneficial to maintain, you know, this constant um, dialogue, and then also ensuring and perhaps guiding, you know, uh, guiding, um, guiding also us as custodian agencies, you know, no, <laughs> we, uh, we have made mistakes in the past as well. And, um, and guiding us also to ensure that uh, that input is provided on time, in line with uh, precise specifications that are needed by the interagency, that would also be very helpful. Thank you very much, Clara. Um, as you said, um, I think we've all learned a lot of lessons um, from the 2020 Comprehensive Review and from that first um, IAG meeting when uh, we had, what, 700 proposals for um, indicators. And I know as a, a member state, um, we were completely overwhelmed um, and did not know what to expect. So we've gone through one comprehensive review. I think, you know, now it's incumbent on us to take what we've learned um, and, and apply it as we move forward. Um, Sarah, we have about two minutes. Um, and as our discussant, I would love to ask you to just give us a couple of concluding remarks, what you would take away from, from today's session um, and, and, and just any other thoughts that you might have. Um, I think, uh, I think for me, um, the way to move forward uh, in the measurement of, of the agenda and the contribution of the sort of measurement to the implementation of the agenda is, is clearly cooperation and dialogue and understanding of all the different stakeholders' perspectives. Uh, and so I think this is also something that I have seen uh, and, and heard from the panelists today, and also from looking at the questions that were, um, were sent in beforehand, uh, that the, the dialogue and uh, the, the cooperation and coordination is and incorporation really more than coordination actually uh, uh, is super uh, uh, important so and and uh, i know it's been a well it's been a struggle really <laughs> it has uh during this whole process since uh, what 2014 when we started discussing this um 
and and understanding and learning about um, other stakeholders um, perspectives and, and needs um, is uh, key, I think, and is also what's fun about it, right? Uh, uh, that would be my key takeaway, I think. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. I think I think you know absolutely. Although you know there have been major challenges, um, and, and we've we've got conflicting priorities. We've got country priorities. We've got NSO constraints. We've got UN custodian agencies and other uh, agencies that that have their mandates um, that they're trying to fill. Um, you know we've got that all coming together, and it's and we're all trying to make our way through that. Um, so it it has been um, it has definitely been a struggle, but at the same time, I think we forged some really good relationships. We found a way forward. Um, I think we all understand that we're all trying to achieve something important for the world. Um, Clara, I, I you know I've always used the this uh, this statement: what gets measured gets monitored. Um, but but I'm going to also incorporate if we measure the wrong thing, we will do the wrong thing. Um, again, in, in a crazy times, data is often weaponized. Um, we don't want to be part of that, but yet we don't want to also measure the wrong thing. Um, so uh, with that, um, I would like to thank so much for uh, our panelists for their insightful presentations and the discussions here. Um, there were more questions that were received on uh, the when you registered, but um, unfortunately, a lot of those questions were outside the the uh, domain for the um, IEAG. Um, we thank you for your questions. Um, there was a question on the timing of the comprehensive review. I just want to note that um, we've taken that to heart. Um, we understand that it does occur over the summer. Uh, session, the summer uh, holiday season. So it is hard to do those consultations within governments during that. And we're going to take that to heart and we're going to work on modifying a little bit the um, the consultation period that countries would have. So maybe I think we have July and August currently. We, we will try to do move into June to August period. So there's a little bit more time outside of the outside of the summer months. But but keep in mind, we also have don't have a lot of time to get um, those things done. Um, I noted that UN, UNSD will develop a website on the 2025 review um, and all the um, presentations and information will be there. And um, with that, I think that is everything. Um, UN, uh, Yongi, is there any anything you would like to add before we close? Um. For the timing of the website, we want to probably uh, have that uh, ready uh, after the statistical commission because we probably receive some feedback from the member state uh, during the commission. So we we'll probably try to incorporate as much information as possible. So we will have all the presentation uh, ready on the uh, site event website and also the recording. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for attending and thank you again to our presenters and our lovely discussant um, for coming today. Um, and I wish you all um, a fantastic rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you thank so you much, Kara. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.